maybe maybe we just start by uh, some introductions, at least from uh, uh, from Francis, because they know Tony, they know Bugo. Bugo, do they know you? Oh, I hope so. Do you know Bugo? Zero trust. Am I who Harry says I am? Okay, so let's have uh, Francis introduce himself. No problem. Uh, good morning, everyone. So, uh, my name is Francis Bongi, and i um, a cybersecurity enthusiast, and I currently work at a company called Platcorp uh, Group, where I'm the group head of IT security. I'm also a part time lecturer at USIU, Africa. So, um, yeah, it's good to be here. Awesome. Um, Bugo, please just introduce yourself, not as the person taking on the program, but who you really are. Fantastic. So, my <laughs> name is Bugo Njigia. I a technology entrepreneur, currently trying to figure out how to move cities smarter. So, trying to use data to figure out how c- the heartbeat of a city and then provide mobility solutions to it in a way that um, is less polluting, more sustainable, and not at a premium. Awesome. So I want us to, Tony did a very good job to get us started in this panel. Um, uh, and, and zero trust is it's in everybody's lips uh, in terms of, um, you know, the sec- security approaches uh, that people are now taking, especially with the cloud and hybrid cloud and multi-cloud. Because uh, security now is becoming more and more complex, um, and the threat actors are also becoming more and more sophisticated. Uh, so how do you how do you manage that landscape? Because you see, you have all your workloads all over the place. You have some in Azure, others in AWS, others in Google uh, Google Cloud. So how do you navigate um, uh, that uh, that space? So I want, I want us to start from, uh, uh, Tony made a very interesting statement that your third party has a third party. And, and we talked about third parties yesterday, uh, but this is very interesting, that even the third party in your network has a third party. Yeah? So how do you manage that mess uh, of an environment? How do you do it? Interesting question, and um, first of all, very interesting presentation from uh, from Anthony. Um, when he talked about when you look at your environment, um, you can't manage, you can't be able to monitor. Uh, Sorry, um, so you can't be able to mon- uh, to manage what you can't monitor. Yeah, and I think he was even talking about in terms of. Uh, of uh, what you have in your environment. When it comes to the vendors, what I would really say is um, when we get into these engagements with uh, all these vendors that we are dealing with, the um, question would be uh, how much of uh, due diligence do we normally do uh, with the vendors that we are dealing with? Uh, in terms of even um, things to do with the, when was the last time they did an audit as a vendor? Um, things to do with the, how is the SLA structured such that um, if there is a breach of the SLA, what happens? Uh, or uh, in terms of when it comes to things to do with uh, uh, data protection, um, so is your, your, your data has been collected. Let's say you're the data processor or the data controller. So your data has been collected by the data controller and passed on to the data processor. But as the, that data subject, do you know that your data is being, is, has been passed on to the, to the third party? So um, I think the first place where most organizations go wrong is in terms of that due diligence. That's just that first step of the vendor onboarding. What processes are you going through? Do you demand of, um, let's say, an audit report from the vendor? Um, when was the last time they did an, an ISMS audit? Are they ISO 27001? Uh, certified. So these are the basic uh, questions that we need to answer at the very onset uh, before we even onboard um, these vendors, whether it's cloud or whatever other services being provided. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Tony? Yeah, sure. I think, and, and, and spot on, uh, Francis, um, uh, those, it's very important just to do those checks. But also what is also important is understanding the data that you have. 
you know, you'd be surprised, many organizations don't really understand the kind of data they give to third parties, or to the extent, um, the extent of that data. Um, and that is where it's always important, first of all, to do a very end-to-end -end mapping, and how that data moves in the environment. Because again, like what Harry mentioned, you're now dealing with a very complex network of interconnected, um, if I may call it, um, entities, right? So understanding the third party, what data are we giving you, to what degree, and even the data that we have resident in our organization. You know, you cannot protect what you do not understand. Yeah? Do you agree with me? You cannot protect what you do not understand. So mapping that data and even understanding the criticality of that data and doing an impact assessment, even what we've seen in the Kenya Data Protection Act, um, data impact assessment, what would happen? What is the worst case scenario? Is this third party would go rogue? Yeah? What impact would it have to your organization? Number one, from a financial perspective. Number two, from a legal perspective. Right now, we're in the day and age where class action suits are going to be very popular, right? Because when people now are aware that their rights have been breached, they can take action. There is a legal framework that can empower them to do that. And number three, what is also the reputation risk that you even have of an organization? Because sometimes you find, you know, trust is a very delicate currency. And once you lose it, if your customers perceive you to be uh, risky to their data, and if at all you're having their financial data, and you know, there's a joke we use likely that there's a vein between the back pocket and the heart. Eh? <laughs> Anything that would touch on my money, I will get extremely passionate about it. So that perception, you know, it can also be a perception. And the worst place you always, I mean, all organizations don't want to end up is KOT. Because those guys are brutal, yeah? <laughs> those guys are brutal. Once you're there, there's that trust, it, which is a currency of trade, you easily lose it. But, and that, uh, but Tony, yeah. is, is all... Because, you see, I was, I was reading uh, somewhere, and they were saying that only 7%, 7, not 70, mm -hmm. only 7% of organizations actually know where their critical data is. So, uh, do you guys know where your critical data is? No, be honest. And what is that critical data? Uh, you, you bring an interesting point, Harry, and I'll, I'll wear the hat of a consumer of some of these services. And the biggest challenge is often that, it may sum up the analogy of the bed sheet. Most of these solutions are blanketed, and they're almost black, black boxish in, in a way, because even, even from the enterprise down to the SME level, the understanding of what zero trust solution layers are is fairly complex. It's good when you explain that, oh, Bogo is in the Maldives and is dialing in for, for the team's meeting and you want there to be a secure connection. You know, that kind of like brings it home. But generally, we don't, we don't kind of like get it. It still remains very abstract and remains something that is out there for the big orgs to do or to take care of. But at the same time, this SME is a supplier to the big org. So the big org is highly, highly at risk mm -hmm. and probably should be looking at scenarios where, down to cost perspective, so most of these solutions don't come cheap, yeah. is how do you then trickle down the benefits of a solution that you as an organization are exposed to mm -hmm. and say to my universe of 10, 20, 30, 50 suppliers, can I expose this solution to them because they are my greatest risk. Where that data sits, and you see, at every hop that data takes, it gets enriched. I pay you, it lands on a third-party system or payment gateway, it gets enriched. goes to a third-party CRM, we've seen a number of them opening shop and saying they'll also help us integrate with, with carry tax manenos, it gets enriched. So with every hop, it gets enriched. But with every hop, we're not also ensuring that we've done the necessary things um, to protect that data. And like you said, the Republic of KOT, and be brutal, but that's the least of your worries. The worry is that if we understand the value of our data, then you know someone's going to take us to the cleaners for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so again, again, I think to me, uh, and you know, you you you're the experts, um, but to me, I, th I think for uh, for organisations to even try to secure, you need to know what you're securing. Yes. Yeah. I think, and, and I think you said that as well. Uh, so, what are the things uh, that organizations need to do 
to be able to even identify because uh, you see you know it, threats will be many um, and and all, not all threats are made equal mm. <laughs> yeah so so which threats do you want to handle so so how how do organizations plan that way okay okay maybe i can go first and i, I know george is here and uh, he's a, a guru in auditing but when we talk about um being able to identify what are the key assets uh, within the organization? What are the critical assets within organizations? Because sometimes when um, organizations don't know what is of value, then they don't know what to protect. So, for instance, when you do an asset inventory and you're able to identify these are my most critical assets, then you can apply a risk metric to it and be able to say that uh, if this particular asset was breached, then this is what this is what we stand to lose in terms of value. I think he did mention uh, in terms of the customer data, the bank's data. If that data falls into uh, competitors' hands, what does that mean in terms of um, uh, the risk that's that's there? And even things to do with um, uh, going the path of when you talk about a data data classification and data protection impact assessment. Um, so you want to identify what's my most critical data and uh, how do I secure that data? Do I have the necessary measures in place uh, to be able to secure that data? Whether it's encryption, whether it's access control, he's just talked about zero trust uh, and being able to do continuous authentication. Who's being able to access this data and do they have the necessary privileges so that you ensure that um, you can, that because it all comes from a point of trust, if the customer knows that you're handling their data in a way that is um, that, that their data is not exposed, then of course uh, the, 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 the trust levels increase. But if the customer uh, comes to learn about, you know, um, a breach uh, like this uh, credit card company in the U.S. I forgot, I'm trying to remember the name, but there was a breach sometime back that happened where credit card details were revealed, but they did not reveal the breach sometime until later on in the year because they're trying to re protect the reputation. But what happened when, when they found out, you know? So when customers know that, that those controls are in place, when they know that you're accountable to a body, uh, like now I think the, for the data commissioner's office, you have to report within 72 hours if there's been a breach. So such kind of things. If those measures are in place, then you're able to identify these are my critical assets in terms of the data, in terms of the devices, in terms of infrastructure, and these are the measures that I need to put in place to protect them. Absolutely. Maybe just to add on, Francis has actually summarized it quite well, uh, because like I even mentioned, now there's that shift from just cyber security, yeah, to actual cyber resilience. Cyber security protect, defend, and make sure everything is okay. Cyber resilient withstand, detect, and make sure you respond effectively. Yeah, and, and an interesting thing is worse than just being breached is actually not taking the right action when it happens. You know, we have this very common, uh, it's almost a cliche now, that it's not a question of if, it's a question of when. Yeah. So anticipating that this ideally will happen one day, you'll have a very careless user who will double click on something. One day you will be a patch behind and this thing will happen one day. Probably the appliance or even collusion can even happen. And this is a very common case, right? In fact, 90% of this hacks that a lot of money has been lost, 90% is collusion. Take that to the bank. Now, and the fact remains, and what Francis has mentioned is, if you're able to respond effectively, do you know even trust levels goes up? And that is why it also entails a lot of stakeholders coming in. Even people who handle even your PR, because also how you communicate is even more important. You can communicate in a way that is going to scare the, the customer, but you can also communicate in a way that's going to give reassurance. And they will know, oh, so you guys are on top of the game. I can be confident that even when these things happen, you are actually taking the right steps. In fact, and thanks for mentioning that, because I remember that Think Capital One, huh? when that thing happened, that is where even these guys suffered even more because now it opened up a class action door. Yeah? So the fact remains that cybersecurity we should not also 
when you're having, if you're a CISO here, you really need to work with other stakeholders as well. Um, your legal team, they need to understand what that would mean from a legal exposure. Your communications team, when this happens, how do you manage KOT? Are you guys keeping track? It can be that one customer that's going to raise a flag. If you reach out to him on time, it's going to, you know that when a fire, you remove that matchbox, that one matchstick, mm -hmm. and it will not spread, right? So that managing of crisis. There was a research, I remember, um, that was done, and this was a Malaysian hotel, that every time a client would have a bad experience, yeah, they'd reach out to that client and tell them, we are aware this happened, and we are going to do A, B, C, and D. Do you know that hotel eventually became the top leading hotel mm -hmm. because of how they responded to incidents? when it happened. So that is extremely important. You cannot predict what will... In fact, even us in cybersecurity, to be very honest, and if we are all to be honest, we are relearning these things because a lot have changed. Now we are talk of talking about AI. Now it has opened a very big Pandora's box, this cognitive threat. There's a malware my team and I were researching and this thing could actually read your behavior. So when you log in like Harry, it knows Harry logs in at 8 a.m. in the morning. The first thing he'll open is Twitter. The second thing is LinkedIn. The third thing is maybe Facebook. And then the last thing is his email. Yeah? So it makes sure that it understands your pattern of life, the POL. And then of course, would, when it's sending out data, it doesn't spike it. Because what have we, these tools that we have, they normally read anything that is out of the norm. So the thing will just mask and make sure it's within the, the normal baseline so that it doesn't cause any alarm. So the tools as we have, I wouldn't say that they are 100%. There is always that five degree of, there's going to be a better tool, a better malware, a better syndicate that's clever enough to bypass all these things. Yeah. I think for me, we also need to take it further than we said awareness. If you've seen what's been happening recently is stuff happens and then businesses react. And the SMSs will come in, remember, don't give your details, spatiam to pin, spatiam to akweke, kadi kwa ATM, the norm. Well, you've got your engineering teams and your technical teams deploying all this amazing tech. We forget that if the customer is not sufficiently empowered with non-technical information, usually say the safety and security starts with you. How do you prevent that one user from losing value? The value that I lost two weeks ago is painful. In these economic times, it is painful. But how do you prevent that from happening so that I don't, like how would I not have become a statistic and I'm already sufficiently educated uh, uh, you know, along these lines? But now for the majority, how do you also keep them at a constant state of awareness so they can also get a feel for this doesn't feel right with your financial institution ins that you say, listen, we need for you to make sure that you're not on open Wi-Fi. We need you to be on, say, mobile data so you can verify something. How do they understand that this is but a simple step being convenienced for 15 seconds so you can protect the 100,000 shillings that lies behind this uh, thing that you're doing, we need to verify that it is you, but, but you know me, you've got my phone number, you have interacted with you on this app before. It takes up another step to kind of like this, come down to the customer level and say, we're doing this because of ABCD, um, sharing use cases, um, and not necessarily making, you know, uh, alluded to waving a big stick and saying, Nikubaya, Nikubaya, but at the same time, this is what you can do to also protect yourself in a way that is non-reactive. We walk the journey with the customers together. So there's, there's a constant state of knowledge sharing. New threats have come. I mean, we see now there's um, GPT-4. Like we'll probably say, zero in on all. Give me all zero day hacks that are live now. And give me, right for me, tools that can exploit that given ABCD. Mm. You know, how do you keep ahead of that? We may not be able to. And we have to realize that as businesses and also tell, uh, you spoke about SLAs, you know, as, as wearing the customer hat and say, can you guarantee me? Are there any guarantees in life? No. So how do you also get our legal teams to be able to craft things that, again, are relatable, that don't hide things in fine print so that when incidents happen, where they say, like, but Mr. Bogwa, look at clause A, B, C, D. Like, no, no, no upfront, but there's absolutely nothing that is 100%. It's been argued that do you then use a multi-supplier approach, but again, costs. Mm -hmm. So these threats are evolving, yeah. 
And but you also have to involve the customers. Correct. Yeah. So so if if you have a question, please you can go to the microphones, uh, um, and and uh, I'll see you and I'll allow you to to ask a question. Uh, but before before that, let's talk about um, AI. AI and machine learning. It's it's like yin and yang. Yeah. Because uh, we we are using it to um, to uh, to build uh, powerful systems uh, which which will help our businesses. Well, how can they doing the same as well? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, what's your take on that? Absolutely. Remember what I said. <laughs> Where there's money to make, yeah. You know, um, a telltale sign that there's money in anything and in any field. The first thing you will see is a lot of innovation, a lot of motivation, and people will devise creative ways, huh? So they say it's a, um, uh, there was that number that it's I think a four billion dollar economy, yeah. And you know when you even go to like even dark web, and I wouldn't recommend anyone to go there unless you're a researcher like most of us in the room. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't recommend the things you. Oh, if you, oh, yeah? you're buying, oh, if you're buying drugs. Yeah, <laughs> guys are buying drugs. The last I saw was cannibal meat being uh, being sold. Yeah, true story. I saw cannibal meat. I almost called my pastor, you know, I was disturbed, man. But anyway, um, yes, there's a lot of creativity even on that side. You know, dark web, you'll see that they've even devised very creative models. Now you have RAS model, RAS, not RAS, RAS, like me see here, but ransomware as a service, yeah? So if I'm not skilled in hacking and all that, and I'm not giving anyone ideas, I'm just saying this just for information, eh? <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah. A good, that's a good business model. Very good business model, because you don't need techie skills to do that. We just agree on a revenue share, it's very simple. You are the guy who has the tool, I come to you, I tell you, I've identified X bank, why don't we partner up? I give you 40%, me I get 60. You do the hard work. Me I see it and I enjoy tools. I mean, you know? So these guys are making money in such ways. So in the same forums, there are these now tools that have actually been devised. I mentioned that malware that we, at some point, we were experimenting. And it's pretty much just understanding your behavior, right? Um, and, and cognitive, I think we are yet to see the full fledge of this malware that have weaponized, you know, by AI capabilities. I think we are yet to see more because right now there's a lot of there's a lot of creativity that goes there. But yes, it's actually something we should worry about. But then the question would be, what should our defenses also look like? Mm. Yeah, and that is where we now need to move from just that old traditional approach, the layered this and this can be certain signatures and all that, to more like they can learn, they can self-learn. You have a security defense that can understand the environment. And it has what we call, um, um, it's, you know, the way the DNA, uh, what do you call it, the white, uh, is it white blood cells? Anything that is an anomaly, it would ideally fight it. So it's more of behavior detection. Anything that has the telltale sign of a ransomware, it doesn't have to have that signature. It can be a zero-day um, 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 zero attack, pretty much, that has been exploited, but it would understand by the actual behavior. And that is what now security is evolving to be. And then, of course, the machine learning, you have many firewalls now that have some infused level of, they can pick data from different sources. They have logged sources that ideally would tell them, and it would be pattern matching pretty much to speak. Um, anything that behaves like this and also behaves like the other ticks certain boxes. So it is actually a threat and it is an abnormal event and we treat it as such. Um, but then, of course, like I said, um, I believe most of these vendors right now, they're in serious R&D mm. yeah? mm. to come up with the next generation of devices. I would be very honest if I, you know, what, like every five years guaranteed, security posture in terms of how this, even these solutions have been designed, all these changes, right? That is why it's also very important that we, we, we become very solution agnostic and really look at what is the outcome here outcome. and how we're going to achieve this. Okay, questions? Two mics. You can cue behind him. <laughs> the British taught us very well to cue. <laughs> 
Uh, thanks. That's, that's an interesting discussion. But the more you talk about it and the more I sit and listen, uh, I, I get very concerned because it looks like, just for an analogy, we are doing what we typically do in Kenya. We go build a nice, beautiful gated community, get ourselves in, beautiful walls, beautiful security. Once we're in the community, we are fine but you've still got to get out and get to work. So what am I saying is, most of the data I would need to create a passable profile of any of you is out there in the public. It's in KRA, it's in NSSF, it's in uh, the hospital, yeah? NHIF, it's uh, in the last cyber you used, it's, it's just all over. So do, do, we, don't we, do we really, you know, we are all protected in our companies, different layers as we need them. But I think the, the big portion of the uh, you know, security threat is probably not within. How, how do we deal with that? Hmm. Interesting. Uh, let's, let's take the other, then we can answer both. The, 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 the surface yeah. has increased. The, yeah. The top, the top. Are you talking to me? <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, first of all, that was a beautiful presentation. Thank you so much, uh, Anthony. Nice to see you uh, in the panels. Uh, my question is, uh, I mean, the business of putting small businesses or giving them some security uh, exposure, and I'm wondering, in terms of zero trust, uh, some companies are not mature enough to actually start implementing zero trust because they're still using legacy products here and there, and they don't have even the bare minimum. So if I'm looking to implement zero trust for most companies, uh, especially startups or government entities, uh, what are the key metrics that I need to look for to make sure that this company is actually mature enough to pick up on zero trust? Thank you. Anyone? Okay, so I can um, take the first question from the gentleman. Um, it is indeed true that um, a lot of our data is out there, and uh, he gave a very good analogy. In a gated community, you're secure, you know, but when you get out there, what happens? Um, most of the times, we talk about the user being the weakest link in the security chain, and that's... Uh, many times proven to be very true. Because think about it this way. Um, Anthony here is working at Deloitte. Um, he's posted all his information on different uh, social platforms, um, be it LinkedIn, be it Twitter. And depending on the level or the amount of information that is posted there, that can actually be used, uh, very easily used against him. Uh, because think about if I want to socially engineer you, uh, all I need to do is go to LinkedIn and uh, find out, you know, which organization are you working for, at what level are you within the organization. So the level that you're at within the organization informs me on what kind of privileges are you likely to have within the organization. Because we talk about, you know, segregation of duties and the privilege of least uh, principle, yeah. So the higher up you are on the chain um, means that probably you have higher privileges or the access the kind of information that you have is quite critical. Yeah, so maybe someone at the C-suite level, the kind of, kind of uh, information that they have access to would be quite sensitive. So once I have that information about you, can I take that information and be able to create uh, a profile against that? Or can I be able to use some information to social engineer you and probably send you a phishing link and get you to respond? And that way I can be able to uh, either impersonate you or possibly just be able to take it a step further. So how do we counter that? I think and most, most of these things can be handled through user awareness training because most people don't know that all that information that you're putting out there, you know, photos of your family, your home location, uh, your home address, and all, that, and all those things, you don't really know that those things can be used against you. So during awareness training sessions, and some of the awareness training sessions that I do, these are some of the things that I'll cover. And I'll be able to let you know that try and limit the kind of information that you put out there. Uh, try and limit uh, the exposure, you know, your exposure, your digital footprint. Because you might be thinking that, yes, this is you as the individual, but that information can circle back to the organization that you're working for. 
you know, depending on the level that you're, that you're at within the organization. So I hope I've tried to answer your question. Uh, if, if he's not satisfied, we can meet at break. <laughs> uh, but but there's, there's the other question. Yeah. Uh, who wants to take that? Okay, I, I can do that. And nice to see you, Judy. Judy's a friend. Um, so yeah, and you know, before we talk about this fancy stuff, zero trust, all those things, the basics have to be covered. And that's where we start, hygiene issues. Mm -hmm. In fact, interestingly, um, most of these successful hacks normally happen not because they don't have zero trust, but they don't have hygiene issues. Mm -hmm. I don't have a clean setup, you know, patch levels, passwords, making sure that configuration issues have been set up. So where I would start is just to make sure those fundamentals are covered. Like just doing a very thorough job to ensure the environment is clean, yeah? Because it's only to the degree that, um, you know, basics are very, even in life, when you miss out on the basics, they catch up with you later on. So in as much as, you know, they may not be mature to, to invest in some of those fancy solutions, sexy if I may call them, they need to also have the rigor to make sure that their fundamentals are covered. And in fact, they don't need budgets for that. Yeah, it's just that discipline, making sure the patch levels are up to date, passwords are well taken, and even um, like awareness and educating guys. Because the thing is, this um, no matter how the weakest people will always be humans. And you know, you have the three categories we call them. There is a careless. Carol, it's just a, a name that we use, Carol, I'm sorry. And then, <laughs> there's the, <laughs> and then there's the innocent Ian. Okay, careless is someone who um, has been educated, did all those e-learnings, knows what they're supposed to do, but they are still a bit, you know, they still click on, t so you have to have a way to deal with that. And then there's the innocent Ian. And innocent Ian is not educated. He didn't attend his class, so he doesn't know anything. So he may see any invoice being posted and he'll click on it. And then the last one is malicious Mike. Ah, yeah, Mike, sorry. <laughs> so interesting, you guys are sitting next to each other, yeah? <laughs> so malicious Mike is a guy who, and this is the one we need to worry about. And so when you mention about your internal, in fact, I always say this, I'm more worried about the guys inside than the guys outside. Because the guys inside understand the lay of the land. They understand the controls environment. They understand where the loopholes are. 90%, any successful hack, big time, lost, um, lot, lots of money has been lost. When you do a thorough forensic, and I speak this with confidence because I've assisted clients with this. You know, they always call us when things are not very nice. Things have gone wrong, right? So most of the time we normally find out that it's actually a collusion between different people that they had an insider. And those are the people we need to worry about. So in as much as you'd want them to invest in amazing stuff, they need to also make sure that they have very basic controls to control even those guys who have the keys to the kingdom. Um, a, a quick thought on that, uh, Judy, before, is before, you, before you respond. So we have a question from an online viewer, mm -hmm. James Alvin, so you'll combine this. Uh, what are the measures put in place to prevent Medusa malware? So I think that should be Francis or, that will be Francis Francis or Tony. My yeah. insight is, is for Judy I, and for others in the room that we've had a layered conversation on this, that also presents the opportunity. Like you see, for most large organizations, they've got dedicated teams that look after some of these dockets, and they still get hit. So the opportunity, if you're looking at giving a solution for uh, you know, SMEs, is how do you help them bulletproof without having that cost burden too much on them? I almost call it it's a managed sort of service, because most of these guys use the same kind of stacks. And if you could almost combine them into the different pots or the different solution bases that they have, whether it's collaborating with um, a cloud provider, whether local or international, and then going to you know, one of the providers of um, zero, zero trust strategy tools, ETC, you may be able to democratize that cost a bit more, give value to the customer where they're saying for the cost of, the cost, for the cost of a, a junior guy, you're able to attain a certain level. If you're going to put it from zero to ten, you're going to achieve at least a level six. That is helping you look at the at the, at the hygiene issues. So that we should take, get that out of the way. And increasingly, like you said, if the larger organizations that these SMEs themselves could come together and say, "Dear big FMCG, since you've got this license, can we have trickle down benefits?" Someone needs to stand in the gap 
for a lot of these guys because my own experience with SMEs is that everyone says you go you go try do when you succeed then you can follow your path so someone needs to come in the middle and say I'm going to try champion this for you it may be a thankless job because you could champion and you end up not getting the benefit of it as a business but someone has to do it so who's going to build that cut who's going to you know, facilitate that conversation. Okay, so, uh, Tony, will you take the Medusa question? What was the question again? Uh, okay. <laughs> um, what are the measures put in place to prevent Medusa malware? What are the measures? To yeah. Let me, let me, then I want you to combine it with your closing remarks. Okay. I'm told with them. Fantastic. Yeah. Let me actually draw a wider net. Okay. Let's not be specific on one warrior. Malware. Let's talk about malware, yes. right? In essence, you know, malware, the way it's been designed, it has to exploit cybersecurity, the principles on one. For a cyber attack to happen, there has to be a vulnerability, number one, right? And there has to be what? A threat, yeah? To exploit that vulnerability for it to happen. So number one is making sure you close those two loops, yeah? And this is where Riga in patching is also extremely important. Remember, like, when we had the ransom, ransomware wave, I think this was 20, was it 2015, 2016? Yeah. Yeah, thereabout. Um, it was based on a vulnerability that was inherent in these appliances, uh, in, in some of the servers and that environment, right? So, what happens then is that rigor just to make sure that there's display in patching because vendors, they're reasonable enough when they detect a vulnerability, they're going to send a patch, right? So, they rigor in that. However, the zero day conversation comes in. What if this is a malware that is actually you know, very new and this thing, this vulnerability, even the vendors have not really, um, have not really, um, you know, um, sent out a patch to fix it. So that is where the layered security and defense in depth also is important, yeah? Being able just to even have different controls and compensating controls at the edge firewall level, at the internal firewall level, and also making sure even your USBs, yeah, you know, your end machines, right? Uh, things like even disabling uh, the USB, but also the USB slots, but also awareness is extremely critical so that people understand. Uh, sometimes it can be something that, you know, there's, a, there's an experiment. Harry, you probably, uh, I've mentioned this before. There's a time we had some malware. We were doing a social engineering experiment, and we took, you know, those Sahara flash disks, the ones that are shiny, you can actually see yourself. Let's see, even ladies can put lipstick with them because they are very shiny. You will not miss it if it's on the floor. So we had payloads there, and we dropped it at the alley of uh, an organization, uh, Organization X. So what happened was typical human behavior. When someone picks up a very shiny flash disk, what do they have? What, what do they do? They slot it in. Plug, in. plug it in. One of the guys who plugged it in was actually the CFO. At his level, he picked something and went, plugged in. He wanted to see. So it comes to even awareness. Just making sure your users are also well educated, right? That they do the right thing. But also making sure that you even have the protective controls, anti malwares and whatnot. Um, but they are always not 100% effective. Let me just put that as a disclaimer because we've seen even the best tools being circumvented by some of these very innovatively crafted uh, malwares. So that's how I'd look at it. But also importantly, do we have any CISOs? Um, someone who's in the IT security team here. I can see one. Um, yeah. There are several. There are several, okay. They're shy. So detection is extremely important. So ability to detect when something happens in your environment. So the question then would be, what level of visibility do you have? If you have a SIM solution, what kind of data is it giving you? Is it actionable data? Have you been able to reduce those noises? Because remember what I said, we need to move from just protection and defense to resilience that we can detect, we can sense, we can resist, and we can react to a malware. Thank that you. is extremely important. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Francis, your closing remarks? Yeah, what I would really want to add and just to what Anthony has said, sometimes we do have legacy um, systems internally, like let's say maybe for the various platforms, even for our OSs, you're running legacy systems that maybe have reached end of life and you can no longer patch them. And maybe it's a hybrid environment. Some, may, some are maybe on the latest 
um, applications or the latest um, the latest versions. So that in itself is a risk. So you want to get to a point where you can standardize your environment so that, as you're saying, even monitoring becomes easy, visibility is easier. And also back to the basics. He talked about the endpoints, he talked about the firewalls, uh, he talked about awareness, because even things like someone sends you an email and it's, it has an uh, payroll.xls, how many will open? Or bonus. Or bonus. <laughs> Almost everyone. So such basic things CFO. that need to... Sorry? CFOs, when they see uh, invoice. Yes. Yeah, invoice. Or payment. Invoice or payment, yeah. yeah. So th th that's, that's what I really want to add on to, to what Antonia said. Thank you. Okay. Bogwa, closing? Don't have much to close on. I think we've closed on a, finished on a, finished on a high. I'm still an advocate for uh, managed shared services and also speaking to the entire all your publics. We focus a lot on, on C suits. Yes, it's a CFO, but it could also be something that has been caused by a customer. So the ideally, like we said, it's, it's, it's evolving. How do we develop that where it will detect that you know there's actually something up? It has to be across all our publics. Awesome. So I think we've come to, a, to the end of this session. Uh, thank you so much, guys. Uh, I think there was a lot of uh, information out there. Uh, I hope you uh, gained something today uh, around the threat landscape and how it's evolving. Uh, but the, the key, I, I think the key message here is uh, don't rest on your laurels. Uh, you have to keep on adapting and keep on uh, looking at how, you know the trends and, and just be in front of everything because uh, as you build your your systems as you become more um, sophisticated in your protections and, and your and your security and defenses and uh, resilience uh, the threat actors are also doing the same uh, they are also looking for better ways of um, you know uh, getting into your systems and the better ways of uh, locking in your systems until it's the right time for them to pounce. Uh, so yeah, we, we just have to continuously become uh, vigilant and, uh, and, and strategic in, in our approach to security. So with those few remarks, I say thank you. Thank you to my uh, panelists. Please give them a round of applause. Um, and uh, back to you, Mbogwa. Um,